Today, I am super excited to have as my guest, Lucius Meiser. Lucius is, in American slang, the real deal holy field on the topic of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Lucius is a member of the board of directors of Bitcoin Swiss. He runs Meiser Economics. He does research in computational finance. Lucius has been closely following Bitcoin since about 2011 and even co-founded the Bitcoin Association Switzerland, uh, where he's also a board member. Lucius also happens to be, to his benefit and mine, the husband of my good friend, Verena. Welcome, Lucius, to the Shot Caller podcast. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read a couple quotes on Bitcoin because I think for the audience, it's going to be a small example of just how polarizing cryptocurrencies and specifically Bitcoin have been to the investment community, to governments, and to the everyday investor who says, I don't know what to make of this. If you don't believe it or don't get it, I don't have the time to try to convince you. Sorry. Satoshi Nakamoto, supposed creator of Bitcoin. It's a fraud and worse than tul tulip bulbs, says Jamie Dimon, CEO of JP Morgan. It's money 2.0, a huge, huge, huge deal, says Chamath, I'm going to massacre the surname, Palahapitya, a venture capitalist who was an early Facebook employee before moving on and setting up his own investment fund and then become uh, or developing 1.1 billion in assets and also became a minority shareholder of the Golden State Warriors. And he believes in the next 20 years that Bitcoin will rise to $1 million. So let's see what Lucius is going to have to stay away with, say about that. Stay away from it. It's a mirage, basically. In terms of cryptocurrencies generally, I can say almost with certainty that they will come to a bad ending. Warren Buffett, legendary investor. And the last one is, I do think Bitcoin is the first encrypted money that has the potential to do something like change the world. Peter Thiel, co-founder of PayPal. And apparently, and you can agree or disagree, Lucius, he um, tried to do something similar with with PayPal as Bitcoin, but they couldn't, they couldn't do it or they couldn't figure it out. And, um, I, and that's one of the reasons he's a fan of what Bitcoin ultimately did. So without further ado, welcome Lucius and uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you. So you want to know a, a, a statement regarding these quotes probably. To see well, I wondered what you think is. about them. You've probably heard so, of uh, several of them. What, what do you yes. think? So yes, yeah, so Bitcoin is very polarizing. And maybe the easiest thing is to start with what it is. So yeah. what it is, it's a, an artificial currency. It's a, a virtual currency, kind of, because there's no institution behind it. Normally, a currency is backed by a big institution, like the ECB or the Federal Reserve in the United States. And with Bitcoin, you don't have that. You just have a few computers that are running the infrastructure but uh, there's no one managing everything. So there's no central authority. And that makes it kind of spooky to many. So, but it also, it's his, that's his biggest strength because it means that no one can abuse the power of printing money. And this is normally, so, so economically you could say that Bitcoin will probably be better money than a currency run by an incompetent central bank but maybe if we have a few of those enough, around the world. <laughs> but if you're lucky enough to have a competent central bank, then maybe that money is better because then they can do some adjustment. They can make sure that the value is stable and so on. And I would, for example, say Switzerland has a competent central bank. So for us, it's Bitcoin is more like a toy than a necessity. Okay. And this also is how I got into it. So when I read about it, I found it very, very interesting. So I have a technical background. And that's why I immediately saw that this is something new and a very interesting new way of uh, transacting online. I had a question for you. What were you planning to do when you grew up, when you went off to university, before you found Bitcoin? What, so, was, your, what was your career goal? So when, you, when I was uh, like 
eight years old, I wanted to be an inventor in the Lego factory. Okay. So that was my career Solid, goal. solid then, career path. <laughs> and then I studied computer science because uh, that's, that allows you to create something. I always wanted to be an engineer who can create. Uh, okay. Things. Okay. Uh, very and, cool. And, uh, in, of course, uh, with IT, you can create anything with a computer in a garage. So you don't need a factory. Like if you do mechanical engineering, you need something much bigger and much more capital to create something. And I heard a great quote that said, if you can dream it in your head, you can hold it in your hands. Yes. And I, I thought that's a great, a great example. When did you first come across Bitcoin? And when you came across it, did you immediately get it? like its application and its future potential? So this was in 2011, early 2011, I guess it was on Reddit, very first. Uh, Reddit, okay. Uh, yes. And uh, it was, so it, it was a, uh, an interesting discussion. So some were very enthusiastic, some thought uh, this is uh, uh, nothing serious, but uh, I read the white paper by Satoshi Nakamoto, the inventor, who until today is unknown. So we don't yep. know who invented this. Yes. And uh, I thought this is very interesting. This could actually work. And my reaction was that, uh, so back at that time, one Bitcoin was 10 cents. Okay. So, and, and my reaction was, okay, there can be at most 21 million. So the current valuation is 2 million. And this is certainly worth more. So I, I, I said, maybe I should buy a few Bitcoins, but that was, was so complicated. That, that was a question I, I had. I, I that had that question. So, so it took me a while and uh, I didn't trust all these online exchanges. So a few months later, I actually met someone in, in person that I found through Bitcoin Talk, which is a famous Bitcoin forum. Okay, Bitcoin and, Talk. And I uh, bought some Bitcoin from him against physical gold. <laughs> ah. So... So how did that transaction work then? So we met. You pegged it to, to gold and. We, we met at the main station and I gave him a small gold bar and he gave me some Bitcoin. Oh my gosh. That's a, that sounds like something that could be in a Jason Bourne movie. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. It, it hopped on Hof. Oh, that's awesome. And that was around 2011. Mm hmm Okay. And am I correct in saying that the entire Bitcoin platform was developed, whether it was Satoshi or not, out of the frustration of people who were impacted by the 2008-2009 financial crisis, that the value of money, you know, in the economies um, dropped so significantly that people were upset that, that a government's mistake or a company's mistake, banking, a banking industry's mistake could have such devastating knock-on consequences for individuals that weren't um, making bad decisions. This certainly helped. So, and in the very first block, in the Genesis block of the Bitcoin blockchain, Satoshi Nakamoto put the reference in there to the headline of the current day, which was about the financial crisis. Okay. So, but the idea is much older. So the oh, okay. challenge of creating a digital cash system and internet money uh, is something that uh, cyberpunks worked on very early on. So, okay. and it's, it's, uh, so what they first uh, invented is uh, encrypted email to encrypt communication, which is also an important element in order to protect yourself right. from. So there's the community where this comes from is... Uh, rooted in deep distrust against corporations and the government. So they want yes. to empower the citizens. They want to say citizens should be able to encrypt their communication yeah. so no one can uh, eavesdrop on them. And they should be able to store their wealth and their value without being at risk of the government taking it away or anyone else. Okay. And that's the essence of Bitcoin. It allows you, allows you to hold something of value without depending on anyone. You don't depend on central banks, not on other banks, not on uh, anyone else. So it, not on the price of the stock market or, I mean. Exactly. Yeah. It, it even works in a war zone. All you need is uh, an internet connection. And there's even satellites, satellites that spread the 
Bitcoin signal, so to speak, the, the, the spread the blockchain. So even if you don't have an internet connection, if you have a satellite receiver, you can see what transactions are happening on the Bitcoin blockchain. Okay, as you do. <laughs> um, okay, so let's let's wade into the explanation of how it works as technical as we need to go, but but keeping in mind most of the audience will not have computer science degrees, nor do I. Um, I've spent some time asking people like you for the last couple of years about Bitcoin, so I have a, a kind of an overview of it. But how would you explain, because I think people don't understand the mathematical side of it, the algorithm, and that every time you mine, I mean, I don't want to do the explanation, but just to give you an idea of where, you, how to, uh, yeah, and understand the concept of how the value is, is keeps increasing, I suppose. Does that make sense? Did I say? Yes. Did I phrase that right? <laughs> yes. So, so yes, there's the technical side and the value side. The, the value side is economical, and the technical side is how it works. So, in principle, we could at any time just say we invent a new money. We could yep. say we create a Shannon coin, and like uh, we declare that everyone uh, has exactly one. And the way to transfer it is to loudly announce it so that everyone knows that I transfer 0 0.5 Shannon coin to whoever. Okay. So, and this is already the essence of the Bitcoin system. So Satoshi Nakamoto said, let's create a currency. There's 21 million Bitcoins. That's the upper limit. And that's how they are distributed. And that's how you can transfer them. And now, of course, you need ways to secure this. For yeah. example, I shouldn't be able to pretend to be someone else. So I should be able to prove that I'm the holder of a particular account or set of Bitcoins. And here we use uh, digital signatures and we use them in a new way. So traditionally, digital signatures, they prove who you are. They prove you are Shannon and then you need a second uh, transaction or a second uh, lookup to find out if Shannon actually owns these uh, assets, whatever it is. But in the Bitcoin system, we skip this intermediate step. We don't prove who we are. We just prove that we own something. It's like when you pay cash at the kiosk buying a newspaper, you don't prove who you are, but you prove that you own 10 Swiss francs by <laughs> holding it in your hand. So yes. this is the essence of, of uh, how it works with digital signatures. These digital signatures allow you to prove that you own certain Bitcoins or to also sign a transaction. So everyone knows this, was, this transaction was signed by the rightful owner. And this is the first technical ingredient to secure the system is digital signatures. And they've been known since the 70s or so. So this is something, this is the most important ingredient and, and the most okay. established. Okay. And then, go ahead. So, in, in total, there's three ingredients. So, the second ingredient is the blockchain, and the third ingredient is the so called consensus mechanism, a way to resolve conflicts. Oh, okay. So, the second ingredient, and this is uh, something that uh, Satoshi Nakamoto uh, came up with to, to store all the transactions, he created a chain of blocks. He said, we create every 10 minutes, we create the block and we put all pending transactions in there. And in the next and 10 minutes later, we create the next block and each block references the previous block with the fingerprint. So if you have the latest block and you know that it is valid, valid thanks to that fingerprint, you can verify the validity of all previous blocks. And by fingerprint, you mean that key, the digital key, is that the fingerprint? It, it, it's not a key, no, it's, oh. just, it's, it's, it's a, we call it hash. In oh, Bitcoin. hash, okay. It's, just, it's kind of, it's something that, it's a very, it's like uh, in German we say quersumme. So if you, it, it's a proof uh, digit, a verification digit. You have it also with credit cards. So if you yeah. get one number wrong, you know, the, it, yeah. it, it, it's not the right number. It's not so going to work, okay. Exactly, and it's basically like a very long proof digit for all the data that comes before. So okay. if you have that number, you can be sure that everything that came before it was correct and not uh, tampered with and you have the original. So 
this reduces the problem quite a bit. So you don't. So if you know that the current block is correct, you also know that all blocks before it are correct. And now we need the third ingredient. We need something to agree to make the network agree on which is the current and correct block. And that's where Satoshi Nakamoto invented uh, proof of work. So okay, yeah. And this, so usually a norm program would say, so we just need a central authority who, who stamps all the blocks and says they're okay and we rely on that. But we don't want to have a central authority. So how can you resolve that? With, and usually resolve it with democracy, you have a vote. And now the problem is in the internet, you can be pretend to be 1 million people. You can be pretend to be 1,000 computers. So how can you have a fair vote? And one way to have a fair vote is to use something that you cannot pretend. And one thing you cannot pretend is computing power. Either you have it or you don't have it. So the way you these votes are done in the Bitcoin system is to prove that you have a lot of computing power. And if you have 10% of the computing power in the network, then you get 10% of the votes, basically. Ah. And that's and these votes are about which block of transaction should come next. And it's uh, and, and that's how, how the network is secured. And if someone had 51% of the computing power, that person could alone determine which transactions go into the next block and which don't. So he could then basically censor the network. You couldn't manipulate the transaction because he cannot forge digital signatures, but he could prevent your transactions from happening. Which is not ideal. Yes, which is not ideal, but that's why it is important that the computing power is distributed. No one alone has these 51%. That's known as the 51% attack. This is the one the most famous attack vector for Bitcoin. Okay. And earlier on the um, blockchain topic, that is where you would put the term immutable. Is that right? Yes. And the reason I bring that up is because oftentimes when people are talking about Bitcoin, you hear this immutable. So I just thought I'd put that word out there and maybe you could just e explain to people what, what that means in, the, in this context. It just means that uh, in order to change a transaction that was accepted by the network, you would have to invest uh, unrealistic amounts of computing power. So, okay. for example, if, uh, if you want to change a transaction that happened one month in the past, the whole network would have to redo one month of calculations. So it would take one month to, if everyone, cooperates and the whole Bitcoin network works together, it would take them one month of uh, uh, intense computing to unroll a transaction that happened one month back. And of course, you never have everyone cooperating on, on this. So, and even someone, uh, for someone who had, let's say 51% of the computing power, it would take them uh, like five years to unroll that and do an attack like this. So it's, it's, that's why it's immutable because it's very, very expensive to change something in the data structure that happens in, happened in the past. And the further in the past it is, the more expensive it gets to change it again. And that's why people advocate for it being difficult to be a fraudulent system. Exactly. You can use it to notarize things. For example, you can, if I have a document, and create its digital fingerprint and put that fingerprint into the Bitcoin blockchain in, let's say, 2015, then I can prove later that, that I already knew that document in 2015. Okay. So, and this is something you cannot mani manipulate. So it's a very, it, it, it could be used as a data structure to notarize things and to prove that uh, they existed already at a certain point in time. And, and some people are talking about potentially applying that to, let's say, pieces of art as well. Um, to, so you know the, the authenticity and the origin uh, of who you bought it from. That's just yes. one, one little so, example. Yes. This is one use case where the idea is to say we attach 
a certain, it's called token, it's just a digital virtual item to a certain piece of art. And then it always gets hairy when you have to connect the blockchain with the actual reality because, and that's normally where it gets not so secure anymore. Yeah. So then that means somewhere on this piece of art, there would be a seal or something that references the number of this token. And whenever you sell the painting, you also move the token to the new owner on mm -hmm. the blockchain. So the owner can prove I have rightfully received it. Uh, but of course, it's like everything in the physical world, maybe you can tamper with the seal or anything. So it's not, it, it, it provides you with a paper trail, but it's not uh, as bulletproof as Bitcoin itself. Okay. Okay. That's good. That's good to understand because I think sometimes it's easy to learn about a new technology if you're able to reference a use case for it. Sometimes it's a bridge to understanding. Um, okay. The best use case, yeah. I would say, is things that are completely virtual, that have no connection with the physical reality. Ah, okay. So one is example is gambling. For gambling, you, you win or lose something, uh, monetary value that is not physical. Okay. So it's very suitable for gambling but it's also very suitable for financial instruments. And that's what I'm most enthusiastic about. So I'm, I, I also am involved in another company that you don't mention. It's called actionariat.com. So this is actionariat is the German word for the collective of all the shareholders of a company. And what I want to do with that is I want to provide the tools to attach these digital tokens that reside on a blockchain to the shares of a company. Okay. So that means when you move this uh, digital token, you actually legally transfer the ownership of the share. And uh, the Swiss parliament is in the process of, of passing a law that actually uh, provides very legal, solid legal foundations for that. So far, you can already do it, but only with a contractual agreement. So we can say, we agree that whenever we move the token, it also means that we have moved the share. But with this new law, it's the law that says the token is the share. Just when you print, there's also laws that say when you print the share, then the paper is the share. And that's the equivalent that they are about to pass, hopefully. So, oh, fantastic. Uh, When's that vote come out then? So uh, Switzerland has a two-chamber system, and the first chamber of parliament already passed it okay. with uh, no vote against, so it was uh, anonymous, and that was in June, and uh, it will go into the second chamber probably in October. I'm not sure yet, but I'm very hopeful that this law will pass this year. Now, Switzerland it, is, a, is, is almost as close to a direct democracy as you can get. Will the people vote on this as well? only if there is a referendum. So for every law that the parliament passes, people have a certain terms, so like I think three months or so where they can collect signatures. And if you get, I'm not sure if, so usually it's 100,000, but if it's against the law that was passed by parliament, I think it's 50,000. If you collect 50,000 signatures, then uh, there would be a public vote. Okay. But I, I doubt that this will happen because it's, it's a very, technical issue that uh, most people don't care about. Okay. And you advise, you're, you've been advising, I think, the Swiss government on some of these topics. Is that right? Yes. I'm part of an expert group. Uh, I'm even mentioned by name in, in the, uh, so there's always, when the government proposes new law, there's the law itself and there's the so-called Botschaft, the message for the law. And yeah. I'm officially mentioned in that message as one of the experts who advise the government in the design of that law and of course oh, i'm very cool. proud of that oh that's awesome well congratulations very nice your hard work is paying off huh yes it's a, it's it's a, i think so the idea to do something about this pro legal problem was uh, i had already in 2015 and in 2016 i had the opportunity to write a comment in nzz which is like the new york times of switzerland so to speak. <laughs> and and uh, but I, I commented that, that there is great potential for putting securities on the blockchain and making them digitally tradable without intermediary. Of course, we already have today digital securities, but you always need an intermediary 
to transfer them on the stock market or maybe a, a physical signature on the Swiss law if it's not on the stock market. And I said we could get rid of these signatures and get rid of the banks and the stock markets if we could digitally transfer them on blockchain. And uh, I also said, but there's one obstacle in the law that needs to be removed. And that's what they are doing now. So it, after my comment in the newspaper, uh, four years later, it looks like uh, oh. it, it's actually been implemented. Wow, <laughs> so that's, that's, that's powerful. Yeah, that's impressive. Of course, I wasn't the only one who's advocated for this. I alone wouldn't have been able to move uh, things. Well, that's that's impressive, and I like that. I I'm a big proponent for people going out and. Um, changing something if they don't agree with it or, or lobbying for something that they think is the better way. So well done you. That's great. I'm glad that you said that this would, you know, bite into the lunch of the big banks because uh, me coming from the, the big banking world, the, what I'm hearing you say, the implications could be very far reaching. Well, I, I mean, I happen to agree anyway that, that, the, that, that the landscape is changing dramatically for many different reasons, not just the digital securities world, but that's a big part of it. So this really could change the landscape and of how people exchange securities amongst each other. Yes, and it's like when the internet came, people were very worried about the traditional media. And of course, this was justified, but it's not just uh, replacing something old with something new that does the same again. It's also creating new opportunities. It's like uh, we have now millions of blogs where you could read information and inform yourself. And I think something similar will happen with uh, securities that we will be able to trade the long tail of securities that are not traded today. So in Switzerland, there's half a million companies, but out of these half a million companies, only 230 are listed on the stock market, only a very small fraction. And I think that, so for many companies, it doesn't make much sense to publicly trade them. But I believe that there's at least, let's say, 5,000 companies in Switzerland alone where it would make sense to have a public market for them. That means that at any time, you, anyone in the public would be able to buy a share or sell a share. That would mean that there's more liquidity, which has lots of benefits. Yes. And so um, I guess, for for people listening, the implication for a smaller company is that a lot of them aren't able to go public because it's very costly all to, to hire uh, attorneys and um, auditors and do file for the documents with the local regulators, and so that's a that's a barrier to to liquidity for a lot of these fast growing companies. Now, you have venture capital is a is a bridge to that, but again, venture capital. Is, is not a perfect world either. And, and finding, for instance, seed capital um, or the early stages before a company's proven, it's, it's like a finding a Bitcoin in a haystack, I suppose. You know, you're, you're, you have to find the right investor who understands you. And, and then these, these uh, small businesses have to spend all their time looking for money instead of building their business. So um, that that's a, could be potential, very, very good opportunity for smaller businesses. Yes, I see it as a new, so that a company usually starts very small with seed capital and then maybe venture capital and then it gets more and more professional, like uh, then maybe there's private equity, maybe there's a trade sale to a bigger company or maybe there's an IPO. So on, on, on the in the beginning of the scale, there's the small seed funded company and at the other end of the scale, there is the big uh, publicly listed company like uh, Coca-Cola or so. And if you move along the scale, the expected returns for investors go down. So in seed funding, the investors, they expect like 20% return per year, at least. Yeah. Because otherwise, it, it, it wouldn't be worth the risk. And it's very volatile. So it, you don't know what it's really worth. It goes up and down. It, it, the company can uh, disappear again and so on. And at the other end, you have very low returns. For example, if you bought... I don't know, into the Swiss stock market 20 years ago, you had a return of 2 or 3%, so very low. Also for historic comparison, historically it should be about 5 to 6%, but it's yeah. been very low. And in the middle, like private equity, I don't know, they expect maybe 7% return. And what I think I can do is if you are a company that is in the 
rather small, not seed stage, but uh, still rather small. We have pro a proven business model. Uh, you're somewhat known. There's a product out there in the market, so the public can somehow uh, evaluate the idea and say this is good, this is bad. If at that stage you allow people, maybe it's not even a public market, maybe it's a market where uh, your clients, your employees can buy and sell shares, and you start creating a market, you basically move a little to the, to me on, for me on the right, to you for <laughs> the left, yeah. of that scale, where the expected returns of the investors is lower. And a lower expected return means a higher valuation. So uh, a company that's worth 10 million, when the ex, uh, investor in, expects 10% return, is worth 20 million when investor works, uh, expects 5% return. So that means by eliminating some, by creating liquidity, by eliminating some of the uncertainty about the price, I cannot eliminate the uncertainty about the business. This goes well or not so well, but I can, through, thanks to the market, we can eliminate some price uncertainty and through the removal of uncertainty, we can make the company more valuable. Mm -hmm. And and this is, uh, this creates a new option for companies that don't want to go the venture capital path, where after five to 10 years, they're pressured to sell everything because venture funds, they usually have this life cycle. And if, if a fund- They want to get goes, their money back. Yeah, oh. They want to get yeah. their money back after a while. So uh, it creates a new option for them. And I think this this will be very interesting to see. Okay. Switzerland is an excellent playground for this because in most countries, uh, securities, the securities market is extremely densely regulated, almost as much as uh, healthcare. This is this is even worse. But also finance is very regulated. So, but in Switzerland, some of the regulation only applies to the publicly listed companies on the official stock markets. For example, all the insider trading regulation, and that means we are much more free to create our own rules and to find rules that make sense for a small company. For example, if a publicly traded company, often, uh, often the, the, the insights are not allowed to trade at all before important announcements and so on. But for smaller companies, the, often 90% of the shareholders are insiders. And if they are not allowed to trade, then the market is dead. Yeah. So you need to find other rules that uh, to, to, to handle these kind of cases. And, and uh, here in Switzerland, we have the freedom to do that. And uh, I hopefully come up with good rules in the markets I plan to create. Well, from what I know of you, you're a very well thought out person and, and I can't imagine that you're, you're definitely not a cowboy. Let's say it like that. <laughs> um, okay. So if, if I could then maybe um, have you go through this a little bit third um, recipe or, or ingredient, if you will, um, of proof of work. Um, how many Bitcoins have been mined so far? 21 million in total. Is that known? Do we know that number? So, yes, we know how many have been mined. So the 21 million is a limit that will never be reached because it's only asymptotically approached. So at the moment, there's like uh, 900 Bitcoins that are being mined per day. Okay. And this is cut in half every four years. Ah, now, okay. Ah, uh, you're going to lead us on to the Bitcoin halving now. Yes, yes. Okay, and, okay. And, and that's how Satoshi Nakamoto ensured that there's a hard limit while at the same time being able to uh, distribute the newly created coins over time. Because he could also have designed the system in a way where he assigned all the 20 million coins to himself on day one, but then there would have been nothing left to create an incentive to participate in the system. So the distribution of this newly minted coin is part, uh, incentivizes people to uh, actually provide computing power. Okay, so did you say every four years? Yes. Okay, so so the most recent halving, what price was Bitcoin before that? So it went up and down, but uh, one could say that uh, in the re most recent halving, it, the price roughly doubled. So we are, are a little above 10,000 now, and a few months before the halving, it was at around 5,000. So the halving is in the price, but then you you double the amount of Bitcoins you have? Is that? No, 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 no. no. So <laughs> it's, the halving is 
concerns how many new bitcoins are put into circulations per day. And before the uh, most frequent halving, it was 1,800, and now it's only 900. And these 900 bitcoins are uh, it's a supply and among, demand thing. I, okay. Yes. It, it, and of course, if you reduce supply by the law of supply and demand, prices should go up. Okay. Okay. It, it's like when, 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 if you would close half the gold mines in the world, then probably the gold prices would go up a little. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm moved along the line. I'm, I'm still getting 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 there but i th that makes sense to me and so you'll never really reach the 21 million upper limit yes so okay um at so, the moment it's like 17 million but i would have to look it up this is just a guess okay and and so in order for the whole bitcoin uh industry is not the right word, uh, ecosystem, to continue as usual or as it should, it requires miners to keep searching for new ones, which is done via heavy computing power and out, just crunching numbers. Is that right? Yes. So economically speaking, the, it works like this. So the miners, they provide the computing power to vote in the network and to yeah. hopefully vote correctly because if they would vote for uh, blocks that contain no transactions or uh, kind of invalid transactions, then they would destroy all the network or make it uh, not very credible anymore. So it's important that they mine the, and verify the correct blocks. And of course, they need a reward for the provision of that computing power. And this reward comes from two sources. One source is the these newly minted coins, and the other source are the transaction fees. So, and over time, as Bitcoin grows in value and is used more and more, the transaction fees are go going up. So, every four years, the reward they get from the newly minted Bitcoins is cut in half, at least uh, when you calculate in bitcoins, if the value of a bitcoin grows more than twice the, uh, in the meantime, then of course the reward, the block reward also increased. And but uh, increasingly a large part of the mining income, the miners are those that provide the computing power, uh, consists of these transaction fees. And this is uh, poses an interesting tax challenge. So <laughs> essentially, so. Uh, and uh, this is also an ongoing discussion in Switzerland uh, on the legal side. So when a miner receives the block reward, what is it? Does he have to charge VAT on that for providing computing power? And the answer here is no, because it's uh, the, the tax authorities say he basically gets it from from from, uh, from the sky. From the sky, <laughs> it falls from the sky, so it's, he doesn't have to charge any taxes. But it's different for the transaction fee. For the transaction fee, they say. There's a counterparty at the other end, the one who wants to do the transaction. And in theory, you would have to charge VAT to the other guy. But uh, for yeah. the Bitcoin system, we are very fortunate because in the VAT law, there's an ex exemption for financial services. Uh -huh. So then you don't have to charge it. But for general purpose blockchains like the Ethereum blockchain, this could be a problem because here the tax authorities could say it's not a financial service. It's just provisioning of computing power and then you would have to charge VAT to someone you don't know. And this, of course, could pose a problem. That and, gets complicated. Uh, I hope we find a way to solve it. That sounds very complicated. Yes. So if, 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 if I go and get a computer and I mine a Bitcoin and I get today it's 10,000 one what is it ten thousand three hundred twenty six was my last check i don't have to pay taxes on that if i'm let's say i'm a swiss citizen i'm in switzerland i'm a swiss citizen uh it would be considered income so if you uh, that would be considered that, income yes ah. but, so the other my other uh, comment was only on vat the value added tax the sales tax okay and so there's no vat on that there's no vat on bitcoin Okay, I see what you mean. Okay, but we still have the income tax side of things to work out. Yes. Which is and usually more punitive than a capital gains tax, typically. 
Yes, in and America, in Britain, we, we are fortunate that we don't have a capital gains tax for private citizens. So okay. if you are Swiss and you buy a, bit, a Bitcoin for 5,000 and sell it for 10,000, that 5,000 you made is not a taxable income. Okay. Yeah, see, I'll never have that experience unless, unless <laughs> I give up my U.S. passport. <laughs> So sad for me. Anyway, <laughs> okay. So that's interesting. But I guess for the people listening, it's it's a, there's a lot of thought that's had to go into this genre, this ecosystem, because it's become now so prolific that the governments are definitely taking an interest. They're definitely trying to figure out figure out how to avoid any fraud situations. Um, but also, let's face it, governments want to get their taxes wherever wherever they can usually. Um, Let's talk just a little bit about the um, the limitations on it. And I know we can't get into too much more detail, but just uh, the ones that I put down would be security in the sense that we've had some some very famous hacks. Mm -hmm. um, losing your, your key, or what do you call it, your digital thumbprint. I've heard horror stories uh, like three or four years ago about someone who accidentally dropped their they handwritten key into the toilet and then uh, could could never recover their Bitcoins. Um, and then scaling. Now I know scaling is probably a part two conversation, but maybe you could just address in a high level those those three limitations and any more that I'm missing. Yes. So on the security side, there's one big problem, and this is the user. <laughs> so uh -huh. the, the the user is normally the the, the weak link. So the weak <laughs> link. Yes. So because. And, and it's, it's not very convenient, I have to say. You have to store this, if you want to control your Bitcoins yourself, you need to store this private key in a way. And this is not something you can store in your, your head because mm -hmm. it's too long. Mm -hmm. So initially uh, I did so on a piece of paper. So I just printed it out because- You know that pain if, if you were to lose it, right? <laughs> yes. but. The advantage of a piece of paper is that uh, there's no way a virus can uh, find it. So, but so if my computer gets infected, the, the hacker doesn't find anything on my computer because okay. it's on a piece of paper. And of course, there's more uh, sophisticated methods. There's specialized hardware to, that's, that does this, that you can connect to your computer through a USB cable. And then if you send Bitcoin some, for, with a piece of paper, you have the problem you cannot send the Bitcoins because in order to send it, you would have to type the private key into the computer. Oh, yeah. And then if a hacker has access to your computer at exactly that point in time, then you have a problem. So in order to overcome that, people have created uh, hardware. The most famous one is called uh, Ledger Nano. Mm -hmm. And this Ledger is, is a kind of a, like a USB stick that you can connect to the computer. And when you send Bitcoins or other cryptocurrencies, you can verify the transaction. It has a small screen on it and the two buttons. So you can say, okay, this transaction I approved. And the private key never leaves the device. So instead your computer sends the transaction to the device and then the device signs the transaction and sends the signed transaction back to the computer. And then the computer sends it to the network. That means even if your computer was hacked, uh, the hacker couldn't steal your coins. Okay. Because and, they, they can't get into the USB device, the external. Exactly. And the, of course, this is not something uh, for everyday payments. For small amounts, of course, uh, you can handle it like cash. You can have a wallet app on your phone or something like that. But still, it will be never as convenient as a credit card. If you lose your credit card, you can pick up your phone, call your bank, you create, get a new one, you can freeze it and so on. This is all not uh, as developed in the crypto world. And my experience is that for that 99% of the users, if they have the choice, they choose the more convenient and less secure option. Like almost no one is running their own email servers because yeah. it's just too convenient to use Gmail or Hotmail or whatever. I myself am a Gmail user. So, but even having the option to take control over everything is very valuable. That means that you can, let's say everything, all the securities were crypto assets. Then you could call your bank and say, if you don't reduce the fees, I will withdraw all my assets, all my shares and uh, bonds or whatever, and store them myself. So it creates a new option. You can threaten 
financial intermediaries that take too high fees without actually doing the work. So you can force them re to reduce their fees, for example. This is, and of course you could, if you live in a world where you cannot trust anyone, you can take control over your assets and your wealth. So this is, the vision is still fulfilled, but it's just an option on having the full control instead of actually executing full control all the time. And so the estimates, estimates are that at least half of all Bitcoins are not held directly by okay. the, their owners, but are held by companies like Bitcoin Swiss yep. on behalf of the owners. So that, that was actually, that's, that's a good segue because I was going to ask you, isn't that a, an ancillary service that Bitcoin Swiss has offered or is offering to, to give someone that, that security of story, storage? Exactly. We offer a product called the Crypto Vault, which yeah. is highly, very well secured in a Swiss mountain where you can store your Bitcoins and other cryptocurrencies. Wow, so and cool. The, and there's uh, quite a bit uh, of Bitcoins and other cryptocurrencies in there. Okay. And how would someone get that, their digital, um, what word is the right word to use there? Their cryptocurrency keys there. Um, would they, they wouldn't email that, right? They would do they physically have to go to Bitcoin Swiss and Zook? And how does it, how would they get their cryptocurrencies to the safe location? So, uh, of course, so you can just send it there. So if you have your crypto, cryptocurrencies on a traditional wallet, yeah. Bitcoin Swiss tells you this is your address. Please send your Bitcoins to that address. Okay. So you open an account with Bitcoin Swiss, you send them as a custodian your yes, yes. cryptocurrency in your name and they're the yes. custodian okay yes. and then they then they save your key somehow or your or it's just there you, i guess if someone if let's just say you had your digital um thumbprint in a piece of paper at home and someone broke in and got that could they then get the your cryptocurrency from you or so if you store it yourself, of course, if someone steals your key, then they can get the cryptocurrencies. Okay. But if you store it with Bitcoin Swiss, then they are responsible for storing that piece of paper. Of course, okay. it's, in their case, it's not a piece of paper, but it's an IT infrastructure with the so-called so multi-signature setup. Okay. So like in the real world with the bank account, that you can have bank accounts where one signature is not enough, where more than when yeah. two or three people need to sign in order to execute the transaction. And this is also possible uh, with Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies that you can say, this, this is an account where one signature is not enough. Other people also need to sign. And this, of course, adds uh, to the security. Okay. Okay. So if I someone steals one key, they cannot do much with that alone. Okay. Okay. And that's, uh, then up to in this example, Bitcoin Swiss's sort of internal controls and making sure that exactly. procedures are followed and and all that sort of thing. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, okay. So I I promised you we wouldn't we wouldn't have such a super long call. So I'll I'll try and um and then I'll try and wrap it up a little bit, but. I, I also appreciate that people listening probably want to hear more. So let's just wait and see what the feedback is. And then maybe I can, you know, buy you a really nice bottle of wine and get you, get you back on for, for stage two, as I have actual questions from people that say, okay, can you explain this further? Um, I think it's too much to go into some of the other cryptocurrencies and sort of technologies out there, but maybe we just say there's other ones called, for instance, Ethereum, XRP, which I read is sort of an open source system, then Ripple seems to be something else. And it was actually founded in 2004 originally, which I thought that was quite, quite interesting. But then I guess it didn't get going until 2012 or something like that. Um, but these yeah, are all... They, they had a different business plan. So in the startup world, we call this pivot. So they changed their business plan and started using the blockchain after they saw how the Bitcoin blockchain works. Okay. So this is, it's not that they invented the blockchain earlier or anything like that. It's just that they start using it uh, after they, they saw that, that, that it works. I see. Okay. Um, okay. Very cool. So I have just a couple little rapid fire questions for you as a, as a guest on the show, just, just, just to, you know, keep you on your toes. Um, 
what's the best investment you've ever made or recently made under $100 or 100 francs? Could be Sorry, a service, an investment in your time, could be anything, under 100 francs. So, so uh, the bit, I bought some Bitcoins under 100 <laughs> francs. <laughs> but like recently, like just recently? Just recently. <laughs> yeah, just oh, recently. This is, this is hard to tell. I would say uh, one of the best things I've bought recently is, is a new type of tea. So I like black tea with vanilla flavor. This is uh, the, the real tea drinkers, uh, they, they don't like that. They think this is uh, Disney stuff or so. But I like it and I found a new one which I really appreciate. And this is what's great. Oh, I love that. Francs per package or so. <laughs> How much is it? I think a package with. Uh, one hundred gram of yeah. tea leaf is like five Swiss francs. See, that's great. I, I try and I try and encourage um, being grateful for the little things as much as the big things. Oh, that's great. I like that. What book do you most recommend people read or gift to people? Is there one book that you really just tell everybody to read, or you might buy for for people? I have a nephew who called me last week, and he he asked me about investment. So he just started his studies and. Uh, he also wanted to know if she, he should buy bitcoins and so on. And then I sent him the Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham. So this is a very old classic because yes. it's it's important. Value to know investing, the, huh? <laughs> value investing because before you so bitcoin investing is not is more like speculation or a, a gambling. I would wouldn't recommend anyone to put all their savings into bitcoins. That would be too stupid. So instead, you can. So, so he, of course, my nephew is very young. He can still take high risks, but nonetheless, I thought it's, it, he should start with, with uh, value investing and, and read about that. That's a good, that's a good recommendation. I, I think the value investors, they are the ones who win in the long run. And uh, I, pref uh, the, I know Professor Hens at the University of Zurich uh, quite well, and he has actually proven that formally. So he has some formal proofs where he can say the one investor that bets that just simply buys the stocks that have the highest expected dividend yield on a mm -hmm. time horizon of tens of thousands of years. So he does it in the very long run. But yeah. in the very long run, the value investors win. Okay. They have to be more patient though. They, yes, they, yes. they, they have really to have to be patient. patient. And of course, the authors, they can still... Uh, uh, win if they find a greater fool. So they're maybe in the short run, others can, uh, but in the long run, it's the value investing that wins. And that also means we have to ask ourselves, what is the long term value of Bitcoin? And this is very hard to assess because Bitcoin doesn't pay a dividend. It's, it's like gold, it just sits there and is valuable. That's and true. That means the question is, how much demand is there for something that just sits there and is valuable? And we know it for gold. And as so if you assume that Bitcoin can become as successful as gold, then one Bitcoin would be worth about $300,000. And this is probably also where this one million figure comes from that you quoted yeah. in the beginning. Yeah. Does it create an existential crisis for you as a person um, having been so successful from investing in Bitcoin, you know, early on, yet in your personality and in your investment style, you are clearly a value investor. Do you have some sort of like split personality there where you're arguing with yourself? Yeah, so it's, I tried out different things for a short while. I did short term trading okay. because markets were so volatile. Yeah. But I learned from the, so after a few months, I tried to find out if, if I made any money with that. And I actually made less money than I would have with just buying and holding. Yeah, so, I totally and, support but that. It was very stressful. Sometimes I got up in the middle of the night and saw the uh, uh, prices crashing or going up and, and I felt the urge to trade. So, and I think this is, this is not uh, sustainable. No. At least for me, it wasn't uh, working out, and and uh, now I'm I'm back to value investing, where I say it's uh, it it. So I'm also I like to take risks. So I'm a risk taking value investor. I would say. Hey, where I, I, I like I, that. Yes. <laughs> I like that. That's good. I I would I would agree with that as well. And I do I do courses now for teens as well as for 
I, I try and market it for women because I feel women are left out of investment conversations uh, too often, whether it's accidental or on purpose. So I do specifically say women come take, you know, ladies come take my stock market course. But um, even throughout my entire career managing money for people, what mostly I did was keep people from um, making uh, stupid decisions in volatile markets. Not that I was a good stock picker or I picked the right portfolio manager, but I always made sure people had asset allocations that reflected their needs and their goals, right? And that was different from every family. And um, one of the statistics I remember, which I haven't refreshed, but I suspect you will recognize this and it's probably not dramatically different, is that 92% um, of someone's return comes from, comes from asset allocation and 6% comes from timing and 2% comes from, sorry, 2% comes from timing and um, then the rest is 6%. I can't remember what that the other factor was, but it was just timing it just being in the market. Um, so the, the biggest chunk of it comes from just having you, your a well diversified portfolio. Yes. Yes. Diversification is something you get for free. Yeah. Everything <laughs> else is very hard. So yeah. Yes. Another thing I, I think sometimes if you have information that no one else has yes then you have a slight advantage and this can, can be something very small for example my wife once said this brand of handbags uh, is great they have a great new designer you have to buy their shares and ah, then i, I did that. and it worked out very well this is one of my best stocks in my portfolio and ah, nice. can you share it <laughs> so it's it, she's uh, said uh, gucci is the gucci. brand so, yeah and and this belongs to caring which is on the stock yeah. market so i bought yeah. these shares and i think this is uh, these observations by someone who actually knows the product they might be under reflected in the stock market because a typical analyst uh -huh. who just reads the number they don't know if a new designer at gucci is worth something or not that's right or maybe they don't appreciate it the right way so in my experience sometimes you can or I talked to someone uh, this week who said when he f saw the new OS X, so this was years uh, ago, the yeah. new operating system of Apple, yeah. he immediately thought this is years ahead of everyone else and he bought Apple stock. So sometimes these small things can make can work in my experience. It's a great of course, advice. Of course, it doesn't work if you do it, if, if, if it's like a herd. So if everyone is buying Tesla, it might not work. So at the moment, Tesla is, is going well, but I at the I would also be very cautious to buy at the current le price level. <laughs> I cannot. I just I actually did a podcast this morning with a, a friend of mine, and we're doing a new series where twice a month we're talking about what's going on in the market. And she's she's just a private investor. She's a music teacher, ex construction superintendent, but she loves the stock market. So I thought, well, we're just two 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 ladies chatting, not not about makeup and hair, but we're chatting about the stock market. And I thought there will be a lot of people out there that will appreciate that. So this morning, actually, we talked about Ant Financial's pending IPO, and we talked a bit about Tesla. And I, I'm, I'm beside myself with understanding how Tesla is trading at a thousand times their PE rate, their PE ratio is a thousand times. I, who's buying the stock? I just, I, I, I like Tesla. I do. But that just seems nuts to me. Yes. So, of course, with a growth stock that with a company that has not realized its full potential yet, you should, cannot look at the past. You need to look at the future and uh, the prices reflect the fantasy investors have for the future of Tesla. Fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just at some point, you know, we've priced in actually some sort of utopia with Tesla. But anyway, it's funny that you mentioned Tesla because I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm an optimist and I believe in technology and innovators, but I, I, I just couldn't get myself to invest in Tesla at this price. Maybe I'm a fool. I don't know, but you know, <laughs> anyway. Um, okay. Last question for you and I'll send you back to your lovely family. Um, if you could create any product, what would it be? It could be a fantasy product. It doesn't have to even work with science. It could be anything made up, but is there anything that you said I could really use that in my life or, or the world could use that? Uh, that's what I'm working on with uh, my latest company, with Aktionariat. This is the online trading, the digital trading of securities. Okay. Well, that with, sounds like more than a fantasy, though. That sounds like that's reality. 
yeah, I, I hope to make it reality, yes. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Well, you have to keep me updated on that. Well, thank you so much, Lucius. I can't wait to um, hear, hear about the second referendum vote and, uh, and uh, watch, watch your future successes. And um, yeah, see you for a glass of wine in the near future. Yes, uh, you too. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.